Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Ortiz. I'm in the marketing department here at the CD Sciences offices, and I'll be your co-host with Dr. Karun. Thank you for joining today's CBD for Health webinar series. Our guest speaker, Dr. Jamie Karun, will be covering cannabinoids, pain, and the endocannabinoid system. Dr. Karun is the founder and medical director of the Center for Medical Cannabis Education. He's also a licensed naturopathic doctor and clinical researcher and advises dietary supplement and cannabis companies regarding science, regulation, and product development. Today's webinar will look at cannabinoids such as CBD and THC to manage pain. In addition to discussing a detailed overview of the role of the ECS in responding to painful stimuli, Dr. Karun will also discuss lessons learned in his clinical practice in San Diego, California. Dr. Karun, welcome. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all of you out there for your time and your attention. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, so I'm going to get right to it. This is a little bit more about me and the Center for Medical Cannabis Education. I'm the founder and the medical director there, and there's some great content there if you want to use it as a resource going forward. As far as conflicts of interest, take everything that I say with a grain of salt as I do consult for a variety of cannabis companies. And with that, let's get into the presentation. So I want to start with the plant because there's a lot of confusion about terminology. So when you hear the word cannabis, it's not entirely clear what it is being referred to. So the scientific name of this plant is cannabis sativa. And it follows a binomial nomenclature that was laid out in 1753 by a Swedish botanist, Carl Linnaeus. And he published all of the plants at that time and classified them based upon their genus and species. And so cannabis is the genus of the plant and sativa is the species. And it is a member of the Cannabaceae family. And there are nine other genera or genuses in that same botanical family. There are a lot of slang uh, names for this plant, like pot, weed, and dope, etc. And many of them are fun and creative, but the two standardized common names that we hear the most are hemp and marijuana. And hemp and marijuana are both cannabis sativa. They're different types of cannabis sativa. And both of them now are also legal terms, so they have been defined. Marijuana was defined in 1970 in the Controlled Substances Act, and so it is a legal term. And many people are reluctant to use the word marijuana because it has this pejorative historical use. In the early part of the, night of the 20th century, in the early and mid 1900s, it was used to try to facilitate a prohibition campaign against this plant. And it was used derogatorily to uh, isolate and single out some minority populations. And even though the word itself is not negative or derogatory in terms of its origin, many people don't want to use the word marijuana, and so they use the word cannabis instead. And the point I want to make here is when you hear the term cannabis, sometimes people are referring to, sp to marijuana specifically, and sometimes they're referring to the genus of the plant, so it can be a little bit confusing. And then hemp was defined in 2018, or excuse me, 2014 in the Farm Bill, and the definition was modified a little bit in the 2018 Farm Bill, and we'll look at that. So hemp is different from marijuana, even though both of them are cannabis sativa from a scientific standpoint. And historically speaking, you used to be able to tell them apart from one another based upon their phenotype or their physical appearance. And the physical appearance of these plants reflected their intended use. So hemp plants were cultivated to be very tall with thick stalks, and spindly little flowers because the purpose of hemp was to produce fiber that was used in textiles like ropes and fabrics and whatnot. And then also to produce seeds for uh, oils for the most part and a little bit for the fiber in the seeds. And over time, hemp plants have changed because now they're being cultivated to produce resin and dissolved in that resin are a variety of different chemical constituents, but most importantly, phytocannabinoids like THC and CBD. So marijuana, on the other hand, the, the, the physical appearance of marijuana plants historically was very different in that they were bred to produce these big uh, flowers that were very rich in resin. So the flowers of the female plant have resin glands 
that exude resin and, and dissolved in that resin are these compounds. And not just phytocannabinoids, but also terpenes and terpenoids and flavonoids and a variety of other chemical constituents. But today things are different. Now hemp plants are being cultivated to produce resin and the compounds within it. And so you could be walking through a field of cannabis plants in Oregon or Colorado, and you wouldn't know whether it was a marijuana plant or a hemp plant based upon its appearance. You would have to take that plant or a sample of it, send it to a lab, and then get a determination from a lab how much THC was in the plant. And that would tell you whether it was a hemp plant or a marijuana plant. And so this is the definition of hemp from the 2018 Farm Bill. And you can say that you can see that it's a cannabis sativa plant with not more than 0.3% THC by dry weight. So that today is the distinction between hemp and marijuana. It's the THC content. Notice that this definition also refers to derivatives and extracts. So hemp-derived uh, CBD products are extracts from the hemp plant. And many companies that manufacture these products formulate the products to contain less than 0.3% THC, even though this definition is from an agricultural bill and refers to plant material. So the FDA is busy trying to come up with regulations for these hemp-derived CBD products. And I would imagine that in the forthcoming regulations, there will be a threshold for THC that is an absolute amount, perhaps uh, in units of parts per million and not a percent. But in the meantime, companies are using this definition to guide how much THC ultimately ends up in their products. So cannabis has been used to treat pain for a very, very long time. There are historical records from ancient China that show that cannabis flower was used with datura flower as a surgical anesthetic, and anesthesia is really the ultimate form of pain control. And there are other artifacts and documents from Egypt and from Greece and other countries, Israel and Rome, that also substantiate this idea that cannabis was used for pain, including in the United States. In the late 1800s and the early and mid 1900s, most of the pharmaceutical companies in the United States manufactured drug products derived from cannabis. And they were used for a variety of different medical purposes, including pain relief. So this is a label of a product that was produced by Eli Lilly, a drug product. The date here is October 11th, 1913. And you can see that this drug product is called Cannabis Americana. And below that, in parentheses, it says Cannabis Sativa American Grown. So they've named this Cannabis Americana because it was grown in America. And then on the line right below that, you can see it says analgesic, which means pain reducing, hypnotic, which means sleep promoting, antispasmodic, which means muscle spasm reducing, and then narcotic, which means sleep promoting, uh, pain reducing and um, euphoric, euphoria producing, I guess. Fast forward to 2017, the National Academies of Sciences, Health and Engineering commissioned a report. They put together an independent panel of experts and asked them to systematically evaluate all of the scientific literature. And they produced a report that was 444 pages and they categorized it based on medical condition. And they determined that there was conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults. And just as a little bit of a tip, when you look at uh, scientific research, when they use the word cannabis, they're typically referring to plant material that is either smoked or vaporized. And when you see cannabinoids, it's typically referring to individual cannabinoids, either synthetic cannabinoids or cannabinoids extracted from the plant and administered orally. So the effects can be different because they're using a different route of administration. So cannabis and cannabinoid research are both important to look at. Okay, so we're gonna dive a little bit into chemistry. There won't be a quiz, but I will talk about some chemical concepts in the next couple of slides. So on the left here, we have CBDA and THCA. And A stands for acid, it's a carboxylic acid. And it's ironic that the plant doesn't actually produce C, 
CBD or THC. We talk all the time about CBD and THC in the plant, but the plant produces acid forms of these molecules, and these are the precursor molecules. They contain a carboxylic acid right off of this carbon here. And there are products available by CD Sciences and other companies that are raw products. And those products contain the acid form of phytocannabinoids. The acid can be removed, and this process is called decarboxylation. And you can see on the right, the carboxylic acid is removed. And now we have the molecules that we're more familiar with, CBD and THC. And they're also referred to as the neutral forms. So we're really in the early stages of trying to ascertain how CBD is different from CBDA and how THC is different from THCA, and then all the way down the line with these other phytocannabinoids. And so it's important to know that when you choose a raw product, you may be getting a different chemical formula, essentially, than when you choose a neutral product. And we don't really know today, from a research standpoint, how different the effects of those different types of products are. And ultimately, they may be regulated differently because one of the reasons why THC or one of the reasons why these products are regulated the way they are, not all of the reasons, but one is because of, of the intoxicating potential of THC. And THCA does not lead to intoxication or impairment. So a couple more chemical structures and chemical formulas. Here we have CBD on the left and we have CBDA on the right. I mentioned that the difference was this carboxylic acid and that um, there could be differing effects or at least different magnitude of effects. So for example, there was a rodent study and there's been more than one that used CBD and CBDA in a comparative setting. And they concluded that the dose of CBDA that was necessary or effective at attenuating nausea in these rodents was a thousand times lower than the dose of CBD. So it's really important that we understand that these two molecules are different and they may have different effects and to keep our eyes open down the road to see uh, how these differences manifest themselves. And then finally, we have CBD on the left and THC now on the right. If you notice, they have the same chemical formula, 21 carbons, 30 hydrogens, and two oxygens. And if you're looking at these molecules, you're probably struggling to see where the difference is. And why would they be different if they have the same chemical formula? Well, molecules that have the same chemical formula but a different chemical structure are called structural isomers. So CBD and THC are structural isomers. The only structural difference is the location of one of the hydrogen atoms. It's on the sixth carbon on the right with THC, and it's on a different carbon on the left with CBD. The location of this one hydrogen atom is the difference between getting high or not getting high, which is pretty amazing when you think about how specific biology can be. And to be fair to THC, there are a lot of other differences, but the thing that people most often think about is this difference between the psychoactive or the intoxicating effects. Now, as I mentioned, these compounds, phytocannabinoids, and all the other compounds dissolved in the resin of the uh, in the that's found in the flower of the female plant can be extracted. And since they are lipid soluble, the extract is usually an oil. And oftentimes it, it's cut with a carrier oil like, like uh, medium chain triglycerides or olive oil or something like that. And you have an extract that's basically non-purified. It has a very uh, wide profile of cannabinoids and terpenes and terpenoids and other types of constituents. And you can purify that extract over time such that you have 98 or 99% CBD or 98 or 99% CBC, whatever your objective is as a company. And so there's this idea out there that isolated CBD products that are purely CBD may have different effects than whole plant or broad spectrum or full spectrum extracts. And you probably heard the term of the entourage effect before, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But there's this notion that a full spectrum extract may be more effective because there are compounds in there that have their own individual biological activity on their own, and therefore they may be contributing to the therapeutic effect. It's important to note that in some circles, this term broad spectrum has come to mean that the product is free of THC. 
But this is not a regulatory term. This is a marketing term. So terms like fat-free or sodium-free are regulatory terms. The FDA has defined what it means for a product to say that it's salt-free. That's not the case here. If it's important for these products to be THC-free, then we should probably have a regulatory term that's used for that. So I often caution people to put too much stock in this idea of broad spectrum meaning THC free. So as far as this idea is concerned, the entourage effect, the simplistic explanation is that there's some sort of synergy that occurs when you, in, when you expose yourself or another person to all of these different uh, phytochemicals and that there can then a, a therapeutic effect can be created that's greater than the sum of their parts. And so the claims behind the entourage effect are really that you can use a lower dose of CBD in a full spectrum extract than you would use if you used isolated CBD and get the same or a superior clinical outcome and experience a lower rate of adverse effects because you're using a lower dose. And there is some science that substantiates this. There's also some science that refutes it, um, but it's really an open question. And we also have the entire world of botanical medicine, not including cannabis, where this entourage effect has also been demonstrated. And so I think there's something here, but we need more research to really be able to draw firm conclusions. So I just want to point out two studies here that are often cited when people are trying to substantiate claims of the entourage effect. In the upper left-hand corner, we have a preclinical study, and preclinical studies are conducted either in animals or test tubes or petri dishes, things like that, whereas clinical trials are conducted exclusively in human subjects. So this is a preclinical study where they compared isolated CBD to CBD in a full-spectrum extract in the setting of acute pain and inflammation in rodents, and we'll look at that study in the next slide. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, we have a meta-analysis of individual observational studies. And a meta-analysis basically takes the data from individual studies and it aggregates it and analyzes it. And so this is a higher level of evidence, but these particular studies were not controlled. These aren't randomized controlled trials, they're just observational studies. And they were conducted with patients who had treatment-resistant epilepsy and they were mostly pediatric patients. But what they found was that in the studies where they were using full spectrum extracts, the effective dose was much less than the studies that were using isolated CBD. So six milligrams per kilogram per day versus 25.3 milligrams per kilogram per day in the studies using isolated CBD. And they also report that subjects in the full spectrum uh, studies experienced fewer adverse effects. So just looking at this study for a moment, this is the one that I mentioned, this is the preclinical study. They took these rodents and they induced acute pain and inflammation by injecting a chemical irritant into the left hind paw. And then they measured a variety of different things. This is the extract that they administered to them. They also administered an isolate, but this is the chemical profile of the extract. So it's roughly 18% CBD, 1% THC, 1% CBC, and then trace amounts of other phytocannabinoids. So this is a full spectrum extract in that it has a variety of different phytochemicals in it. In the world of medical cannabis or medical marijuana, this type of product would be referred to as an 18 to one. And since this is an extract, and since the THC concentration is greater than 0.3%, this extract by US law would be a marijuana product even if it was extracted from a hemp plant that initially had less than 0.3% THC. And that's a little confusing, but that's the way the world works right now. This is figure four from the study. On the left, we have a graph for the isolated CBD. On the right, we have a graph for the full spectrum extract. On the vertical axis, we have serum TNF alpha. And, serum, and TNF alpha is an inflammatory chemical that's produced by white blood cells that we'll hear about in a future slide. And that's measured on the vertical axis as concentration. On the horizontal axis, we have the dose of CBD on the left, and then the dose of the extract on the right. I've taken 18% of the extract and then 1.1% 
to reflect the dose of CBD and THC respectively so that we can compare apples to apples. If you look at the left, you can see that 25 milligrams per kilogram of isolated CBD led to the greatest reduction in TNF alpha concentration and that higher doses did not lead to lower concentrations. But on the right, we see a very different dose response curve. We see a linear downward trend where higher doses of CBD did actually lead to lower concentrations of TNF alpha. And then also, if you look comparatively, you can see that roughly between four and a half and nine milligrams of CBD on the right is roughly equivalent to 25 milligrams of CBD on the left. So this does seem to substantiate the claim that you may be able to use a lower dose and get a superior clinical effect. And of course, this is a preclinical study in rodents and it's specifically with regard to pain and inflammation. And so that doesn't necessarily mean it extends to human or other conditions. But it's interesting to note this is a piece of the puzzle. All right, now we're gonna switch gears a bit and talk about the endocannabinoid system. This system has been preserved over hundreds of millions of years, and that gives us an indication of how important it is. It's said to be more than 600 million years old. It's present in every animal species except for insects, and it is an extensive signaling system. The signaling molecules are endocannabinoids, and they are distributed throughout the body, and we'll talk about that in a lot of detail. But the basic idea for the endocannabinoid system is that these molecules act to restore homeostasis when homeostasis or balance has been disrupt disrupted. And a cellular stressor is a disruption to the balance of the internal environment, and that could be anything from an infection to an injury or acute and chronic disease, and many other things. The discovery of the endocannabinoid system began with the search for the active ingredient in cannabis. The molecule CBD itself was isolated in 1940, but it wasn't characterized structurally until 1963. In Israel, with a researcher by the name of Raphael Meshulam and his team at Hebrew University, administered CBD to lab animals and to humans, and they wanted to see if it mimicked the effects of cannabis extracts, and it did not. So they determined that CBD was an inactive ingredient, and they put it on the shelf. A year later, they isolated THC, and they characterized THC from a structural standpoint. They administered THC to lab animals and humans, and it did mimic the effects of cannabis extracts. And as a result, they concluded that THC was the active ingredient in cannabis, and that became the focus of most research going forward. But they also, they also had to ask a question and then try to answer that question. And that was, how does this particular molecule mediate its effects in the body? And they used the endogenous opioid system as a blueprint and hypothesized that there must be a receptor in the central nervous system that was activated by THC. And so they set out to try to identify that receptor. In 1988, they discovered the first cannabinoid receptor and named it CB1. And then they said, well, why would we have a receptor for a molecule that was produced by a plant? We must have our own molecule that we produce that activates the same receptor. And then in 1992, they discovered the first endocannabinoid arachidonyl ethanolamine, or AEA. It was also named anandamide. Ananda is the Sanskrit word for bliss or joy. And then a year later, they discovered a second endocannabinoid receptor, the CB2 receptor. And then two years after that, they discovered a second endocannabinoid and named it 2 arachidonyl glycerol. So there are three basic elements of the endocannabinoid system. There are the endocannabinoids themselves, cannabinoid receptors, and then the enzymes that biosynthesize or produce them, and then hydrolyze or degrade them. So endo or cannabinoid receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. As I mentioned, there are two of them. And the, the CB1 receptor is principally located in the central nervous system, in the brain and the spinal cord, and then on nerves that extend into the periphery of the body. 
The CB2 receptor is primarily located on immune tissues like white blood cells and lymphoid tissue, but also on organs like the heart and the liver and the spleen, etc. These endocannabinoids, like phytocannabinoids, are lipids. They're lipid signaling molecules, and they're produced very quickly and they're degraded very quickly. So they have a very short half-life in the body. I just you want to use this slide to draw your attention to the differences between these molecules. So they really don't look like each other, endo and phytocannabinoids, but they act like each other. At least THC does. THC acts like endocannabinoids and CBD doesn't. And CBD doesn't really act like THC either. And we will elucidate those differences in upcoming slides. With regard to pharmacology, you've probably heard of this idea that a receptor is like a lock and a ligand or a molecule is like a key and the key can fit in the lock. And if it turns the lock, then the receptor is activated and that initiates a biochemical cascade inside the cell. And some pathway is activated that typically leads to something happening in the cell. Maybe it's a gene being turned on or maybe it's a gene being turned off. And that is true as it relates to endocannabinoids and THC and some other phytocannabinoids, but not CBD. THC and endocannabinoids like anandamide and 2-AG activate cannabinoid receptors. They bind to the active site and initiate that biochemical cascade. CBD, on the other hand, does not do that. It does not activate cannabinoid receptors, but it does bind to them. It just binds to a different site. And in doing so, it changes the conformation or the shape of the receptor. And it changes the shape of the receptor in such a way as to reduce the strength of the binding of THC and endocannabinoids to the other site, that active site. This is called negative allosteric modulation. Really, all you need to know is that it modulates cannabinoid receptors but does not activate them. So this doesn't really explain how CBD does everything that it does in the body but it may explain something about the entourage effect and why administering THC and CBD together may have different effects than just administering THC alone. Okay, now we're gonna look at some of the mechanics here and we're gonna first talk about neuroregulation. So here we have two neurons and neurons are simply nerve cells. On the top, we have a presynaptic neuron and it's, this presynaptic refers to the uh, the location above the synapse, the space right here is the synapse. And this neuron down here is a postsynaptic neuron. So this one is below the synapse and this one is above the synapse. And nerves talk to each other. This is called neurotransmission. And they talk to each other using neurotransmitters. Glutamate here is an example of a neurotransmitter. So is serotonin, so is dopamine, so is norepinephrine. All of these types of neurotransmitters are peptides and peptides are proteins. I mentioned earlier that endocannabinoids are fatty acids. Fatty acids are lipids. Inside the nervous system, endocannabinoids are also neurotransmitters, and we'll look at that. But they're different right now in terms of the fact that one is a lipid and the other is a peptide. Glutamate is stored in vesicles. It's synthesized ahead of time, and then when the nerves, when an impulse comes shooting down this nerve, it triggers these vesicles to fuse with the membrane and spill their contents into the synapse. Glutamate diffuses and binds to a receptor and then the nerve or the impulse is propagated down this nerve. But what also happens is the enzymes that synthesize endocannabinoids are also activated. They pick off an arachidonic acid from the cell membrane right here and they formulate arachidonyl ethanolamine by, by combining it with ethanolamine. And now this endocannabinoid anandamide is traveling in the opposite direction. This is called retrograde transmission, and it binds to a CB1 receptor on the presynaptic neuron. So this is the opposite direction, and it causes these vesicles that contain glutamate to retract. So this is basically acting as a shutoff switch, and it's reducing the production and secretion of glutamate, which when unregulated can be toxic. Moving on to the immune system and immunoregulation. This is a diagram of the cross section of the gut. We can see the lumen is up here. This is where your food is. And then there's different layers of the gut, including muscle layers. 
And we have two white blood cells, two different types, that have infiltrated the wall of the gut here, a mast cell and a macrophage. And this tells us that there's inflammation because this is what happens in the presence of inflammation. So these two white blood cells are blown up right here. This is the macrophage, and you can see that it is producing TNF-alpha. And this mast cell is also producing TNF-alpha. These are inflammatory mediators, and they're producing more than TNF-alpha, by the way. But it's also, they're also producing anandamide. Anandamide is being produced to restore homeostasis. This is the effective function of the endocannabinoid system. That anandamide is diffusing and binding to CB2 receptors on the macrophage itself and on the nearby mast cell. And when it activates those CB2 receptors, this leads to a decrease in the production and secretion of TNF-alpha. So this is immune regulation, this is anti-regulation, or excuse me, anti-inflammation. Before we saw these endocannabinoids turning off an excitatory neurotransmitter, and here we see it turning off an inflammatory cytokine. And one was in the nervous system, and this is in the immune system. And the endocannabinoid system talks to every system in the body. Now, everything that I've said thus far with regard to activating these cannabinoid receptors does not pertain to CBD. CBD, however, has been labeled a very promiscuous molecule because it interacts with a variety of different molecular targets. The last count I saw was 65 different molecular targets. And a molecular target is a receptor, for example, but it's also an enzyme or transport protein. So these fatty acids can interact with proteins all over the body. And we're still really trying to understand how CBD does what it does, but here are a few potential explanations. FAAH, or FA, is an acronym that describes fatty acid amide hydrolase, which is the enzyme that breaks down anandamide. And CBD has been demonstrated to inhibit this enzyme. And in doing so, it slows down the breakdown of anandamide, which means that it effectively extends the half-life. And this is potentially one of the primary mechanisms by which CBD exerts its effects in the body. Over to the right, we have a serotonin receptor. There are seven different serotonin receptors. CBD activates one of them. And this particular receptor, the 5-HT1A receptor, is a known target for uh, anxiety as well as nausea and vomiting. And perhaps this is how CBD reduces nausea and vomiting and reduces anxiety through this receptor. And by the way, this receptor is outside the endocannabinoid system, scientifically speaking. Another example is the TRIP-V1 cation channel, often called a receptor. But this particular receptor is uh, associated with pain and inflammation. CBD also activates this receptor. And so perhaps this is how CBD exerts its analgesic and anti-inflammatory effects. So there's a really a lot of open questions about how CBD does what it does, and that's one of the reasons why the, the research going forward will be so exciting. Okay, speaking of research, we're gonna dive into pain now and look at some studies and also some pain physiology. So there has been an explosion in research supporting the efficacy of cannabis and CBD as a therapy for pain. There's a lot of different types of research, and it's important to understand that each method or each design has limitations and it also has uh, you know, advantages. There has been a lot of anecdotal reports of patients and consumers and healthcare providers using hemp-derived CBD products and experiencing a wide variety of therapeutic benefits. There have also been cross-sectional studies, which are complex surveys where all of these individual patient-reported outcomes are curated and analyzed and reported. And this is a study that was published in 2016 by, by a colleague of mine, Michelle Sexton. And it shows that among people using cannabis for medical purposes, that the most common medical condition that they use it to treat is pain. And there are studies like this that look specifically at CBD. This is a study I had published in 2017, I think, 2018, excuse me, Almost 4,000 respondents reporting that they use hemp-derived CBD products to treat chronic pain, arthritis, and joint pain more than any other medical condition. 
And this is a study that was published in 2017 that Michelle and I teamed up to do that looked at drug substitution. So almost 2,500 people reported that they used cannabis as a substitute for opioids, but also for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and other non-opioid analgesics. And there are randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews and meta-analyses. The, the double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial is kind of the gold standard, but if you could take a lot of those trials and systematically evaluate them, that's even higher quality of evidence. So this was published in 2009 and included 19, or excuse me, 18 randomized control trials, and the authors concluded that cannabis was moderately efficacious for the treatment of chronic pain. Six years later, another systematic review was published. This one had 11 randomized control trials, and it said it was, they concluded it was modestly effective. So kind of moderately efficacious and modestly effective. And then in 2018, another systematic review, this time with 47 studies, the authors concluded that cannabinoids were unlikely to be highly effective. So we have modestly efficacious, we have moderately effective, and, and a higher bar here, highly effective. So this story is obviously still being written. None of the randomized controlled trials in any of these systematic reviews included hemp-derived CBD products. And so we need a whole new evidence base, and that evidence base is emerging. And we'll look at one such study uh, at the end of this presentation. But just so that you're clear, for the most part, these randomized controlled trials are using either inhaled cannabis or uh, orally administered cannabinoids, either THC or THC with CBD. Okay. Now pain, obviously pain is a big problem from a healthcare standpoint and from a social standpoint. It's one of the most common reasons that individuals seek medical care. Chronic pain can lead to psychoemotional distress, anxiety, depression. It can lead to sleep uh, disturbances. It can lead to lost income and have pretty uh, dramatic economic impacts uh, across business and culture. And it can lead to a dependence or an addiction to opioids, which obviously has catastrophic uh, consequences as we're seeing today. These are a number of different data points with regard to the opioid epidemic. They're from 2016 from the CDC. In the interest of time, I just want to point out that the most common cause of accidental death in the United States is death by prescription drug. And the most common prescription drug responsible is opioids. And so obviously this is a huge problem. If CBD, THC, or cannabis itself was able to reduce people's reliance on opioids, um, that would be very important. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is happening, but again, not all evidence is the same, and we need even a higher quality of evidence before we can make really firm conclusions about whether that's taking place or not. But I am seeing that myself in my clinical practice, and I'm, I'm certainly not the only one. And from a safety standpoint, this is the marijuana drug fact sheet from the DEA and they report that no overdose death of marijuana has ever been reported. That's something you hear a lot, but it's nice when it comes from the DEA itself. And so I always like to cite them uh, for that particular statement. Now, chronic pain is not one thing. It's kind of like cancer. I mean, prostate cancer is different than lung cancer, which is different than breast cancer. And there are different types of pain, and we won't go into all of the different types, but from a medical standpoint, they're classified as being different. Inflammatory pain is different than neuropathic pain. Not only might it feel different for an individual, but the pathophysiology, the mechanisms may be different, or they are different, frankly. And so finding one treatment to treat all types of pain is kind of idealistic. And so we may find out over time that CBD may be more effective for treating one type of pain, and THC might be effective for treating another type of pain. But at this point, those are mostly open questions. Another important uh, concept when you're looking at this research is there's a lot of preclinical research, which I said before was not conducted in human beings. Pain itself is a psycho-emotional experience. Pain is basically suffering. It's, it's, it's your response to this physical sensation. And so when we look at rodents, we don't know if they're in pain. We're trying to interpret their behavior. So, 
scientifically speaking, nociception is often the concept that you'll see in studies. So they say pain is not pain until it reaches the brain, and prior to that, it's nociception. Okay, so in looking at the mechanisms here, on the left of this slide, we have that macrophage in the mast cell that we saw before in the gut. And we know that these cells are producing inflammatory chemicals. And in this particular instance, they're doing so because on the right, a nail has been plunged into the index finger on this person's hand. And when tissue and uh, cell damage occurs, the cells spill their contents into the extracellular fluid and inflammation results. So we know that TNF-alpha and other inflammatory cytokines are being produced right there at that fingertip. And we also know that the white blood cells are producing anandamide and they are decreasing that. So right here in the periphery, we have one mechanism by which endocannabinoids are reducing pain and inflammation. But we also know that this signal is going to ascend along this nerve and it's gonna go up the spinal cord and into the brain, okay? And so here, oops, we have a synapse in the spinal cord. And I've, ch I've changed the picture now on the left from the white blood cells to the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron. This exact same thing that we talked about before is happening right here. So now we have another relay station where endocannabinoids can try to shut off this signal and prevent it from getting to the brain. So we're just right here in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and we already have two mechanisms, right here, anti-inflammation, and right here, basically, neuroregulation, trying to prevent this signal from getting up to the brain. And there's a, a third, there's a second relay station right here in the thalamus, and the same exact thing occurs, neuroregulation. And then the neurons project from the thalamus right here into the various pain centers in the brain, and when they hit those centers, then this is perceived as pain and the person starts to suffer. And so there's another opportunity here for uh, neuroregulation. And then built into this system are descending pathways that are also designed to modulate those signals as they're ascending up to the brain. So there's a variety of different ways that the endocannabinoid system is acting to prevent the pain from reach or the signal from reaching the brain and being perceived as pain. Okay, we're gonna look at a few more research studies now. This particular study was conducted in 2010. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, and it was in patients that had intractable cancer-related pain. And the primary outcome of this particular study was a 30% or more decrease in pain. And this is often the threshold that is used for determining whether a certain analgesic is uh, effective or not, a 30% reduction on pain. And so you can see that the placebo group on the very far right, uh, about 20% of them experienced a 30% reduction in pain or more. And the THC group, just to their left, only a slightly higher percentage experienced 30% reduction or more. But when they added CBD to the condition, it doubled. More than 40% of individuals reported a 30% reduction in pain or more. So this is, idea, this is an idea here that CBD is adding some sort of incremental pain relief. And perhaps this is the entourage effect, or perhaps this is just the addition of CBD's pain relieving effects. Okay, this is the last study I want to mention. Since the Farm Bill was passed in December of 2018, a year ago, the um, restrictions around using hemp products in research were lifted. And so there are a number of companies that have invested in research, and CV Sciences is one of them. CV Sciences has a study that is not yet published, but the abstract is available, and I would encourage everyone to read it. They didn't include pain-related outcomes, so I did not include it in this presentation, but it's a great study and I would encourage you to check it out. This particular study did use pain-related outcomes and that's why I've included it in this presentation. So this was a prospective study. It was not a randomized controlled trial. They had about 100 people, more or less, and they were, having, uh, they were in pain and using opioids. And they tracked them over eight weeks and they measured levels at baseline at four weeks and at eight weeks. And they allowed these subjects to determine what dose of CBD to take. 
and they were using a hemp derived CBD product. And on average, each individual is taking around 30 milligrams of CBD in a full spectrum extract per day. And they had four validated instruments that are used in clinical research. And I'm just going to focus on the pain related ones, but um, the other two, one was a sleep one and one was just an overall quality of life measure. This is the chemical analysis of the drug product that was used in this clinical trial. They were soft gels, and as I mentioned, the research participants determined their own dose. But in each soft gel, there was almost 16 milligrams of CBD, half a milligram of THC, and then less than a milligram of a variety of other phytocannabinoids, and then some terpenes as well. So this would be a full spectrum hemp-derived CBD product. On the right, we have table one from the study. On the left, I am reproducing a figure from the study. So we have the pain disability index on the left, and we have the pain enjoyment and general activity scale on the right. The blue color is baseline, the orange color is week four, and the gray color is week eight. So you can see at baseline, on average, these individuals who were in chronic pain and on opioids had an average pain score of 38 on a scale of zero to 70. And by week eight, their pain decreased by about four points to 34.1. And then on the right, they had an average score of 6.5 on a zero to 10 scale. And by week eight, their pain decreased by almost a point to 5.7. And in addition to those outcomes, 53% of the participants either reduced or eliminated their opioids, which is a, a very meaningful percentage, and 94% of them reported improvements in their quality of life. So this particular study is important, as is the CV Sciences study. I would expect that we're going to see a lot of studies on these hemp-derived products in the next 6 to 12 months, given that the, hemp, that the Farm Bill allowed for the, the research to be conducted. And so keep your eyes open going forward on these studies because we need more studies on the products that people are using today. So with that, I will thank you for your time and your attention and open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Curran, for presenting. Um, we're going to take about 10 minutes uh, to answer a few questions. And the first one is, is there any evidence that CBD can help sexual receptors while taking an SRRI drug? I'm going to reframe that question and say, is there any evidence that CBD has been effective at treating sexual dysfunction on those taking SSRIs? And if my, my reframing of your question is wrong, please say so. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence to that effect, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? This can be submitted now. All right. Um, is the THC limit 3% or 0.3% for full spectrum? So the percent THC is 0.3% and it's for cannabis sativa. And if the cannabis sativa plant does not contain more than 0.3%, then it's hemp. Regardless of whether it's labeled whole plant or full spectrum or broad spectrum, that 0.3% really applies to the plant material, as I mentioned. And what's more important is the milligram amount of THC. For example, if I go back to this particular product that was used in this clinical trial, you can see that there's half a milligram of THC in each soft gel. So that's really the more important number because a percent of 100 is, is a different number than a percent of 1,000. So what we really want to know is the absolute number. And so each one of these capsules contains 0.5 milligrams of THC. And we would ask, like, is that enough THC to create a therapeutic effect? Well, we don't really know. Is that enough THC to get someone high? Well, probably not, but there's probably somebody out there that might feel a little bit high with half a milligram of THC. 
And then we could ask, is 0.5 milligrams of THC enough for someone to fail a drug test? Well, we don't really know the answer to that either. I guess it's theoretically possible, but it's unlikely. All right. Um, and the last study was the dosage 30 milligrams. The participants in the study were allowed to self titrate their dose. And you see this a lot in uh, studies using cannabinoids, especially THC, because THC has this intoxicating potential. So the average was around 30 milligrams per research participant per day, but some were taking more than that. Some were taking 60 or 90 and some were taking less. Okay. Um, what, in your opinion, is the best way to explain benefits to uninformed retail customers, um, as in layman basic terminology? That is a very good question. So if we're talking about CBD and hemp-derived CBD products, I guess I would say something like we are in the early stages of really understanding how these products work, but we have some science that indicates how they might work. And that's obviously the infrastructure upon which we can explain how they exert their effects. So there's a scientific basis without getting into the details of what that is as to why these might be effective. And we're seeing a lot of reports and many different types of research studies, both in humans and animals, that are giving us hope that there's a, a signal there that we will be able to refine over time. So I would say to the customer, don't get carried away by the hype, but there's certainly enough reason to be, uh, to be curious here. And since these products are very safe generally, and since they're very affordable, it's really, um, there's not a lot of, of barriers to actually try them. So I would encourage you to try it and see if it does help you. Will full spectrum CBD show up on a drug test, um, for example, um, for employment purposes? So we don't know the answer to that question. As I mentioned, we're not sure how much you would need to take over what period of time. Um, and again, it depends on the milligram amount of THC as opposed to whether it's full spectrum or broad spectrum. If failing a drug test means you're going to lose your job or the consequence might be something equally severe, then I would recommend using an isolated CBD product as opposed to a full spectrum or a broad spectrum product. And as I said before, I would not rely on broad spectrum as a label claim to give me the assurance that there's no THC in there. And you can get for many or, or most of the very reputable companies in this space, they will make the certificate of analysis available to you for the batch that your product came from. And you can see how much THC is in there and from a milligram perspective. Now, unfortunately, we don't know whether that amount, whatever it is, is going to uh, allow you to pass or, or um, you know, I guess, allow you to pass a drug test. And so the, that answer is really undetermined uh, thus far. Thank you. How do we know if the cannabis being grown in, is natural or GMO-based? Well, I guess you would have to contact the manufacturer of the product that you're considering buying and ask them where they source their hemp. You know, so they're going to pr probably have a partner that's cultivating that hemp in Europe or in China or in Canada or maybe here in the U.S. And you'll have to ask them what the growing practices are of the plant material. Okay, this will be our last question. At what dose of CBD have you experienced inhibition of P450 enzymes? This is a very good question. This is a very complicated question. So just for those of you who don't understand the question, we have a, a enzyme system in all of our cells, but especially in our liver cells called the cytochrome P450 enzyme complex. And they metabolize the vast majority of drugs, whether they are prescription drugs or not. And these enzymes are very busy if you're taking many medications. And so some of the enzymes can be inhibited by certain medications. And so CBD inhibits some of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And inhibits means it slows them down. And in doing so, it could affect the blood levels of other medications that are being uh, metabolized by those same enzymes. And so there's a lot of biological variability. The dose for one person that would lead to a clinically significant inhibition may be different than another. 
But if we look at studies, um, and we look at studies in humans, really we're talking about very high doses of CBD, 600, 800, 900, 1200 milligrams of CBD. And keep in mind that, you know, the worst case scenario is that you're taking CBD with your other prescription drug and they're arriving at the liver at the same time. And these two molecules show up and the enzyme says, hmm, which one of these am I going to metabolize right now? And so the dose really matters and the timing really matters, as does the person's individual biology. And so if you are on prescription drugs, uh, it would be a good idea to consult a healthcare professional before using a CBD product, especially if you're going to be using higher doses. Great, thank you. Um, and to conclude today's uh, webinar, thank you all for submitting your questions. Thank you, Dr. Karun, for being our guest speaker um, of our last consumer webinar of 2019. And last, to all of our listeners, we'd like to thank you for joining Dr. Karun's webinar by offering 20% off all Plus CBD products. An email blast will be sent out tomorrow with a follow-up email containing a promo code. The 20% discount is valid now through December 15th, so please keep an eye out in your inbox to take advantage of the offer. Enjoy the rest of your day, and happy holidays.